This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs The Playbook, and I have another dragon from the Dragon's Den, Vince Guzzo, president and CEO of Cinemas Guzzo, entrepreneur, philanthropist, which is most important to me. Welcome to The Playbook. How are you doing, Vince? Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, it's so much fun to have someone that, you know, sees a lot of deals because yep. I think, you know, I have a higher education forced by my mom's philosophy of doctor, lawyer, or failure. And yet I keep telling her I get an MBA a day from all the deal flow that I see and understanding human nature more than any of the business or legal aspects that I learned in school. Um, for you, what's the greatest lesson that you've learned from all the deal flow that you've seen? I, you know, I, th I think the best lesson, uh, you know, that always comes to mind is the, um, the humbleness of people, you know, when they're pitching deals, right? I mean, you've got, you got to be, as, I, I've, as I've repeated often on Dragon's Den, I, you know, and I say all the time, I say, you've got to be confident enough, but humble enough. Uh, and, and it's a great mixture of the two, right? Because you walk in, you've got to be able to make whoever is, is listening to your pitch or listening to, you know, your, your sales pitch or deck pitch or whatever pitch, uh, feel that you know what you're talking about. But you've also got to make them feel that you're willing to accept his comments, his questions, his, you know, uh, you've got to be humble in the whole process. You can't just say, hey, you know, uh, uh, you guys don't know what I'm talking about, right? So I have this argument all the time, you know, depending on the age of the banker I'm dealing with, you know, some of them don't understand movie theaters and some of them are big fans of movie theaters, right? And so that's where at the end of the day, we're always uh, trying to mix the two. But, uh, I, you know, I would tell you, is the human contact that has to still come through. It's not only about the numbers. Um, I, I've, you know, I've seen amazing deals that I didn't close because I just couldn't relate to the, to, the, to the person asking for the investment or asking to be partners. What do you think, you know, been blessed as well to be on a couple of pitch shows here. We have Elevator Pitch and Two Minute Drill in America. And people are asking me, and I got to ask you, what is it that creates that emotional attachment, you know, when we're talking about pitching on a TV show? Because, you you know, you know, and I know that vetting the deal uh, is very difficult during the show, and there has to be some little bit of work on the back end, but the emotional aspect is so critical. What do you think some tips are for you to become emotionally attached uh, with the credibility necessary to go ahead and move forward with an investment? Well, you know, I think it's important when you're, when you're pitching, you know, I at least look for, you know, is the person who's pitching before me coachable? Is it somebody that, you know, is going to actually take my advice or is it somebody that just wants my money in, in, in a run? Then you have to remember that when you come on the den, I think a lot of people seem to forget that we know that probably any possible bank that's already said no to you and your, you know, your, your friends and family, you know, the love money, as I call it, that's also tapped out. So I'm all, you know, we're almost your last resort, right? So while that could mean we could possibly try and take advantage, the truth of the matter is I never try to take advantage of a partner because at the end of the day, I don't have the time to run the business. So I need somebody that is invested and interested to actually work with me in the partnership and not somebody who says, oh, well, you know, I feel I didn't get you know, I, I got shortchanged on this deal, so I'm going to walk away because then I end up with having a company to run or a problem on my hands, right? Uh, you know, I, I often say to my wife that partnerships are exactly the same in marriage as they are in business. You know, it's about, you know, complementing each other and it's not about being photocopies of each other. Um, you know, whatever, whatever I'm good at, the partner that I want to be with is somebody that's not as good at what I do, but is better at things I don't do as well. Uh, and sometimes, you know, inventors are the best, right? Because they're inventors. The problem is, are they willing to accept that that's what they are, inventors? So are they willing now to accept that their product's going to be sold, not in, the, not in the image or in the way they see it, but rather how it should be sold, right? So, for example, you know, we get a lot of this in the food space. You know, you got a guy who's a chef and he creates amazing, an amazing product. His goal is I want to open up my own factory. I want to do this. No, 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 no. Stop it. You got to create a brand. You've created a good product. Can we now have a co-packer doing this? So it's the co-packer who's invested 20, 30, 40 million 
in equipment and not you, right? Or not us. And all of a sudden you realize that you're teaching a chef. You're not in the kitchen anymore. You're now a businessman. You've got to get out of the kitchen and right. And so you've got to have that R and D kitchen, but you're not a production kitchen. Um, and, and that's where ultimately sometimes I get worried because I see the guys, you know, I, one of the best examples I can give you is every once in a while I go into my theaters and I would see a manager selling tickets and I'd say to him, what are you doing? He says, I'm selling the tickets. Okay. And why? Well, because, you know, we're too busy at, at the at the concession stand. So I took the girl from here and I put her there. Okay. Who's doing your job of managing? Uh, nobody right now. Okay. So you realize that whatever you're paid per hour, you're now just worth minimum wage, right? So you've now downgraded yourself to a ticket salesman when really you should be managing the troops, right? So a general is a general. Unfortunately, there are people who are soldiers and just have a hard time understanding that they will one day become uh, 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 generals and therefore they have to act like a general and plan the, enough soldiers so that they never need to leave the general's uh, uh, job and go down to be a soldier because if, if you get killed as a soldier, then you got no general, right? So it's that analogy that not everybody realizes that their job is not only to be in the kitchen. It's actually to move out of the kitchen, but that kitchen experience is important. That's what made you. That's what you need to always be humbled and reminded you don't want to end up having to go back to that. So you've got to plan it appropriately. Yeah, it's amazing because it's a catch-22 when I see an entrepreneur that's in love with their product because obviously I want them to be inspired by what they're doing, but it's a two-sided sword when they're yeah. only in love with the product and they forget it's there to make money uh, and there's certain things that need to be done and regulated in a quantitative manner. Um, yeah. Now, you you have a nickname, and I thought it was because of your glowing personality, but I think there's more to the story. Uh, your nickname is Mr. Sunshine. Uh, for the people in America especially, can you explain your nickname to us? Well, it comes from, it comes from the fact that as a child or very young uh, teenager, I was wearing a flower uh, uh, lapel button, you know, sort of pin or something, right? So it was so. So that flower has been. So everybody always says that you know I can I can do two things. I can walk into a room and be, you know, the the sunshine of the day and everything, and I can also walk in and be, you know, that scorching hot, you know, sunburn, uh, 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 sunshine. And so <laughs> the duality of the sunshine, and so it just became. You know, something that's stuck in, in uh, I guess it was started in about grade 11, 12, 13. And then it just followed all the way. And then as I always wore, you know, because as a teenager, I would only wear the the, the, the flower uh, uh, decoration as a, um, you know, sort of when, when, you know, when I dressed up. Then as I got out of university, I would always wear a blazer. So I always had it. So now it became a repeated, you know, reference point to it. You know, one of my favorite questions to ask dragons and sharks and great entrepreneurs is always their relationship with money and with giving and receiving. So whether it's Cuban or Higgins or uh, Harrington's a good friend as well, I love to learn about their relationship with money and how it's attributed to their relationship between giving and receiving, especially in the context of a business deal. What's your relationship with money and how do you feel about giving and receiving and how does that interact with each other? So, you know, I, I, I live in a, in a very strange province, one which has a very negative relationship to money. Money is not important. Right? We don't, it's, it can't be about money, you know, and then, in the middle of COVID, I said to somebody, it's never important. Money's never an issue until you don't have any, until you realize that it pays for better hospital care and it pays for the meals and it pays for a better lifestyle. It, you know, money doesn't buy happiness, but it sure makes, you know, living in misery a lot, <laughs> a lot better. Okay. So that's, that's, I, the I always say, it, here's one for you, Vince. It allows you to shop. So if you shop for the right things, you're going to be really happy. That's right. That's right. But <laughs> when it comes to giving, you know, one of the things I've learned to do is give in a way that it's not only the money I'm giving, but it's also a message I'm trying to impact. And, and I guess the best example I can give you is when I decided to donate money to hospitals, I donated it to the imaging department. But one of the conditions was that if I bought a new imaging machine, 
they couldn't get rid of the old one. So they had to use both, right? So one of them would be less efficient and the new one would be, you know, super whatever. Uh, and so what happened after six, seven months that I had done that in one of the hospitals, I had gotten a call from a minister of health of Quebec saying, what are you doing? I says, what do you mean, what am I doing? Says, what the hell are you doing? Why are you giving money to these hospitals and forcing them to keep the old machines? I go, what do you care? He says, well, Vince, by getting twice the, you know, scans done or twice the MRIs done, you're actually triggering a quicker spend on the treatment side. You're blowing my budget. He says, okay, so you figured it out, right? I, I don't think you manage your budget properly. So because you don't understand, I think it's going to cost us cheaper long-term if we treat people quicker. You know, a lot of people don't realize that the imaging department is the funnel of the whole Medicare system, right? So you just basically limit the amount of scans you can do and, or imaging reports you can do, and you don't have to treat people as much, right? So, uh, or as many people. So this way now, the quicker you can treat cancer, the treat, quicker you can treat any anything, the less it's going to be costly. Sure, short term, you're doubling maybe, you know, the amount of treatments, but on a long term basis, people will not be as sick as long. And when you are going to treat earlier, you're treating a smaller cancer than when you're waiting six months for a scan. That may be a different cancer you're treating, right? So when we give the money, we don't only give it to say, here's the money see you later, we actually give it with an unexpected result, right? We're expecting a social community-minded response, per se. You know, it's, a, it's amazing listening to you because you remind me of Steve Jobs that you are one of the few people, you don't see things forward, you're always reverse engineering or you're connecting the dots from where it is backwards and the effect and the impact that it has. How do you, you know, you're doing so much, especially this year uh, with new programs geared to support the local businesses and entrepreneurs by Pardon. you, but it's so difficult to provide, you know, that type of insight and empower other entrepreneurs and local businesses to use a combination of their common sense, but also I think it's a combination of common sense and math. You know, you're very mathematical about connecting right. the dots backwards and saying, okay, here's minimum wage and here's a manager's salary. Why would you put the round peg in the square hole? You're diminishing the capacity and you're decreasing our, our revenue. Um, how do you help advise, you know, small businesses, entrepreneurs to figure out that math? Because I think the emotional side you got down, but that math is the keen, subtle, subtle uh, success that you've had. I can pick it up already in a few minutes that right. you figure out those margins quickly. Yeah. So look, I, uh, you know, I was in a, in a deal pitch yesterday um, and I asked the guy and I said, how much money do you have to make to run this company? Cause right now you're running it as a side hustle, right? So he, he, you know, he felt uneasy about ans you know, asking the question. He said, no, but look, I need to figure out what do you think the job of a president of this corporation would be? And I need to figure it out because I need to figure out what the cost of salaries is going to be so that I can figure out how much money we need to make to break even, right? And he was like, I don't know, maybe 35000 I looked at him and said, so you're going to live on 35000 well, no, I'm, I'm, you know, and then all of a sudden you get people to say, no, look, guys, I asked you, let's be realistic. Don't tell me I'm willing to live with $500 a week as if I'm in a COVID situation, because the minute we get out of COVID, $500 will not be enough anymore because now you're going back to socializing. You're going back to restaurants. So, so, you, so you need to make maybe a thousand bucks a week. So let's do the math properly so that I can evaluate it, right? Part of that came from when I was in law school and I would ask questions to, you know, to my professors and they would say to me, why are you always trying to find the way around the law or, or, the, or the article per se? This is very simple. If I can find the way around it, that means I've understood it. So many times my whole reasoning is, okay, this is the product. This is how you want to do it. Okay. What if, why couldn't I do it this way, right? So I challenge the investor or the or, or the sort of the, the 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 person you know pitching me for my investment. I challenge them to see if they've actually had that critical analysis and ask themselves, 
You know, like, for example, a lot of people don't realize that in the food business today, the same factory produces four items which compete against each other. And the success of one versus the other is just the brand. And it's the amount of investment in the brand, right? So everybody thinks the bigger the money is in the cost of the good, but it isn't. The real cost is how much marketing dollars am I going to put behind this brand, right? What's the story behind the brand? So a lot of people who sometimes come up with a name and say, this is the name, okay? What's the story behind it? I don't know. I just came up with that name. Why? Because I like the name. That, really? And then you challenge the person. You find out that there is a history, and they're embarrassed of the history. You say, but why? Tell me the truth. Tell me what you want. Tell me what, you know, so... And so you want the critical analysis. You want people to question. You know, I, I always like to say to people, what's the worst that can happen if you and I get into an argument and, and we're at opposite ends of the argument? The worst that can happen is I leave with my opinion, you leave with your opinion. But what could also happen is I understand out of the 10 arguments you've you know, put on the table, I didn't know four of them. So now I leave that debate a lot smarter because now I know a little more of what you're, why you're, where you're coming from. And by consequence, we get to a, a closer middle ground, right? That's what sometimes investing is about. The problem is, you know, a pitch on Dragon's Den lasts half an hour to an hour. And we have zero background when you come on. The only thing I know is your name. That's about it. So <laughs> sometimes, you know, we get upset because we say like, but, it doesn't make sense what you're telling us, right? And a lot of people don't understand that, you know, and we've seen it on some pitches. I had to go figure out that I asked the person something and they were talking to me units instead of dollars. And then <laughs> while everybody's criticizing them, saying, yo, you don't know the numbers. And says, no way. I think she just didn't understand the question. What are you talking about? She says, how many chocolate bars she sold? Okay, it's not what I want to know. I want to know how much, is, so how much is every chocolate bar? This much. Okay, so this is your total revenue. Yes, okay. Right. So and that analysis, it was just a habit from law school of always questioning, because remember, in law school, you can end up on both sides of that argument. You can be defending it. You can be, you know, trying to condemn it. So how do you. So for me, it was let me really understand how to skate, depending on the client I'm going to get. Right. That was the whole argument. So, and, and that's important to get entrepreneurs to question themselves at that level. Yeah, I could see both of us being recovering lawyers. Uh, the open and closed ended questions are critical. But I yep. think it also the philosophy that I learned early on was, you know, it's OK to trust people, but you have to be able to vet them. You have to be able to ask the hard questions. And I'm amazed how many investors at work so hard, they yep. invest so much in themselves, but yep. yet they're afraid of offending somebody by asking a hard question. Uh, or an additional question, yep. and and then they'll blame the person for overselling, lying, manipulating, or cheating them when they should take accountability. Hey, you need to ask the question. That's right? right. You, you need to ask the hard, and you're not going to offend anyone. Last question, real quick. Um, personalities like yours and mine, extremely persistent. There is no give up. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to make it happen one way or another when we have a vision or a goal. But it's very difficult to uh, balance or blend patience with that persistence. And as I got older here, I started realizing that not only is humility so important, but patience uh, as well to allow things to compound in their interest, to aggregate in their effect, to accelerate in this natural course without putting a forced sales cycle on something, for example. How have you been able to, you know, carry the philanthropy, the humility that you have, but also I see, you know, one of the most persistent people I've ever met that is able to blend patience as well. How are you able to blend those two? Well, you know, I always tell my wife, my wife, you know, is, is my biggest uh, fan and she's my biggest critic sometimes. <laughs> uh, you know, every once in a while, she always says to me, you know, let's say I'm, 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 I don't know, I'm having a discussion with one of the boys or something. And she says to me, she says, you know, you got to let them win once in a while. And I says, no, but I do let them win. Says, no, you don't. You're always like, no. I said, this is what people don't understand. When I'm right, I'm right. Which means I'm not backing down. When I'm wrong, you just don't hear me. So what you don't get from me is the satisfaction that you're right. But 
if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I'm, I'm not even bringing it up if I'm wrong, right? I sit there, I listen to you, and I say, okay. So now you've won the debate, but all you got for me was, okay. Now the problem is that when I'm right, now I'm beating at you till I'm right, till you agree. <laughs> now you've tried, you've come back, you've you know clawed at it, and then eventually you give up and say, okay, yeah, you're right. So you feel that you lost. But in reality, I always tell the boys, you know, my kids, you didn't lose. You actually won the knowledge that a 51-year-old is giving you. So you didn't lose. As for me, I didn't win or lose. I let you win because you deserve to win. So I'm mature enough not to get into an argument with somebody when I know they're right. Right? The only person I don't do that with is my daughter. She's the youngest one. And she's the one that's the most like me in the sense that, She's either all in or she's not there, right? So she, she's a pit bull and she's a 10-year-old. But then again, she grew up with four older brothers. So, you know, she's a tough woman, right? And so one day, you know, somebody's going to tell me, you know, you, you raised a really tough woman. Says, no, I didn't. The whole family did because there's four older brothers there, you know, and everybody's, you know, protective of her, but everybody's also, you know, picking at her sometimes. And she – so – when she gets mad, she gets mad, right? So a lot of people on Dragon's End would say to me, said, last season, you didn't say, listen to me as often as normally say, listen. You know, normally one of the things I say often on Dragon's End is, okay, listen to me. Now, a lot of people need to understand that when I say, listen to me, it's because now I'm getting upset because you're not listening to what I'm saying and you're just going rambling on with your, do you think you're doing your, Used car salesman pitch on I me. Mean, it ain't working. I usually get upset. So in last season, somebody said to me, says, you haven't said it a lot. You know, I don't know. I guess COVID softened me up a bit. And, you know, and I'm, I don't want to beat up on people more than they're already down and everything. But get ready because season 16, I'm in a bad mood. And I'm going to be telling a lot of people to listen to me a lot more. <laughs> well, I'm always listening and it's not what you say, it's what you hear. And right. I hear you, Vince, you and I are soul brothers because we have grown up in a very similar aspect with the same backgrounds. And it's just so nice to hear the gentle giant of a dragon who is entrepreneurial, but also a philanthropist, extremely humble, kind, but also knows the value of a dollar and how to get the most out of it. It's been such a pleasure to get your playbook to success. This is Vince Guzzo, the president and CEO of Cinema Guzzo, as well as the dragon on Dragon's Den. You can catch him on season 16, Holy La Moly. This is Dave Meltzer, what an honor, here on Entrepreneurs, The Playbook. 